Oh, noble one, a moment of your uh, time. I'm sorry, friend. I'm... I am not a beggar, oh, heaven-born. I am teller of fortune. Yes, but I... The past, the present, the future. I see all, I yes, tell all. Very interesting. Oh, sure. greatest of great lords, may your back never bend. Oh, thank you. May your beard never grow white. Oh, I'll try not to. Thank a you. A little but... back sheesh, and I read uh, your fortune. Thanks very much, old man. I'm busy making my fortune. I don't need to have it told. Show me your palm, noble one. Let me but see the line of your destiny. Okay, okay, friend, but make it snappy. Ah, the hand of the wanderer, the seeker. It is difficult to tell your fortune, my lord, because you have no fortune. Oh? You have many fortune. Well, that's nice to hear, old man, but let's get down to cases. When am I going to get rich? You will always be near to wealth and see many women. Oh, that's good. Beautiful women. Well, that's better. Dark women. I like blondes, too. But only one wife. Also redheads. What's that about a wife? Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character originally created in the motion picture The Third Man. With zither music by Anton Kara. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie, The Third Man. Yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. Harry Lyme had many lives. And I can recount all of them. How do I know? Very simple. Because my name is Harry Lyme. <laughs> Friends, the story of my marriage, my first marriage, and believe you me, my last. It all began in the funny little city of Becorata. There isn't much to do there except get married. The principal local occupation, of course, is getting rich, and that's what brought me to Becorata. It's hidden away, as you probably know, in a remote corner of Saudi Arabia. Mines of black gold oil derricks dot the landscape as far as you can see, and huddled beneath these modern steel skeletons lies a city as old as the East. Curio dealers hawk their wares in the narrow winding streets, beggars doze in shadowed doorways, robed Arabs mingle with Europeans in soiled whites, and the city drowses with all the indolence of Asia. An ideal place for a murder and a double cross in oil, oil, to grease the skids of fortune for Harry Lyme. Now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man in Love Affair. Decorata, Saudi Arabia. Harry Lyme, that's me. A happy young bachelor strolling along the narrow street that led from the Grand Hotel to the Native Bazaar. Oh, noble one. A moment of your uh, time. I'm sorry, friend. I'm... I am not a beggar, oh heaven born. I am teller of fortune. Yes, but I'm. The past, the present, the future. I see all, yes, I tell uh, all. Very interesting. Oh, sure. greatest of great lords, may your back never bend. Oh, thank you. May your beard never grow white. Well, I'll try not to. Thank a you. A little no. back sheesh, and I read uh, your fortune. Thanks very much, old man. I'm busy making my fortune. I don't need to have it told. Show me your palm, noble one. 
Let me but see the line of your desk. Okay, okay, friend, but make it snappy. Ah, the hand of the wanderer, the seeker. It is difficult to tell your fortune, my lord, because you have no fortune. Oh? You have many fortune. Well, that's nice to hear, old man, but let's get down to cases. When am I going to get rich? You will always be near to wealth and see many women. Oh, that's good. Beautiful women. Well, that's better. Dark women. I like blondes, too. But only one wife. Also redheads. What's that about a wife? Noble one, you will only be married once. Married well, once is too much. Put it mildly, I'm afraid you've got your fortunes mixed up. You will travel, great one, quickly and across many lands. And you travel with a wife. Okay, now you've had your fun. I'll say goodbye. Wait! Wait, you have not paid me. Why should I, friend? I'm Harry Lyme. But you don't know about me. I'd fill a book, and nobody's going to write it without paying me royalties. So long, old man. Still the same sweet, generous Harry Lyme. Schweig, what are you doing, Beccarata? Just exactly what you think I'm doing. Checking up on you. The same sweet, lovable Carl Schweig. Where can we talk, eh? Almost anywhere. It's the time for Salat. No one will bother us. Come on, go into this cafe here. It doesn't look very clean. Uh, it'll answer your needs, don't you think? You follow me? Well, it doesn't seem to be anyone around. What do you want, Schweig? What do I want? I want to know whether you've obtained the oil leases. That is what you're being paid for, isn't it, Mr. Lyon? Not too well paid. I'm Quit sorry toying with me, Harry. I'm not toying with you. What do you expect? Everything in this city moves by inches. I've made friends here. I'm real chummy with Aleph, and I think I've got him in a receptive mood. Actually, I'm sure he doesn't realize how important oil is going to be here in a few years. If I can't force him to sign the minute, things don't work that way. I know, I know. We have perfect confidence in you. And why did you come here? To make sure that our confidence wasn't misplaced. Oh, I see. Yeah. And do you think you might be able to settle the matter of the oil lease? I have an appointment with the and late this afternoon, he's out mm -hmm. at his summer palace now. It's about 40 miles from the city. When I get back, I get in touch with you. He'll be at the Grand Hotel, I guess. I'll be gone by this afternoon, Harry, but I do have others working for me. I'll know it if you try to double-cross me. Your government will get the leases, Schweig. Now, about the money. I brought you a draft to pay for your services to date. Here. Mm. And thank you. Oh, hey, what's this? Hey, this hardly covers my hotel bill. My fair getting here. You're trying to... Your final payment will be waiting for you at the Bank International no, but... when you have concluded negotiations. But how will anyone at the bank know when I... They'll know, Harry. They'll know. I was still burning about the size of the check as I left Schweig and headed for the Bank International. I hadn't been surprised to learn that Schweig's government had other agents in Bicarada, but I wondered how it was possible for someone employed by the bank to know when the elephant had acceded to my requests. As I entered the shabby monument of finance, I searched the bland, inscrutable faces behind the cages, but they told me nothing. Well, I'd come to cash the check, not play charades. I slid the infuriating little piece of engraved paper through the opening of the window of the chief teller, a lovely-looking lad, if you care for the pockmarked, beady-eyed, murderous type. He glanced down at the check and then up at me. You are Harry Lyons? Yes, I have my credentials. Here. That won't be necessary. You are already well known in this city. Oh, that's very flattering. How did you want this, Mr. Lyons? I don't care about the denominations, but I wanted American money. American money? Yeah, you see, I'm an American. I'm sentimental about American money. Very well, Mr. Lyons. Mm. Here you are, sir. One, two, three, four, five hundred dollars. Thank you. However, with the current rate of exchange, I might advise you to... Pardon me, Mr. Lyme. Huh? I apologize for approaching you on the street, but I must speak to you at once. Who are you? My name would not mean anything to you, but I can tell you this. I am no friend of Karl Schweig. Oh, that's good. Any enemy of Karl Schweig is a friend of mine. What can I do for you? It is a matter of what I can do for you. To begin with, may I drive you back to your hotel? I uh, have my own car. Thank you do not much. own a car, Mr. Lyme, and the Citroën you have rented, you did not use today. You left it in the hotel garage to be serviced. You want it in good running order for your trip to the Alafin Summer Palace later in the day. Mm -hmm. well, I'd be delighted to accept a lift back to the hotel. That's your car there? Yes. Gregory, uh, the car is my own, incidentally. There are some governments that are not as cautious of their purse strings as the employers of your Mr. Schweig. Hmm, Gregory, we will drive Mr. Lyme to the Grand Hotel. Do not hurry. Well, old man, you know all about my car, my engagement this afternoon, apparently my business here in Becarada. What more would you like to know? You do me an injustice, Mr. Lyme. I do not seek anything. I wish to give you something here. What do you want kidnapped for this kind of money? Mr. Lyme, we are both here in Becorata for the same thing, but there are two major differences. 
You want the oil leases for the country, who gave you that check you just cashed at the bank. I want the leases for another power. Mm -hmm. yes. To date, you have been successful, and I have not been. I have no signed agreements, you old man. You will have. Authoritative sources tell me that it has become a personal thing between you and the Alafin. You have exercised great charm on him. He will sign the leases made out by you to whatever power you select. Mm, maybe. I want you to make out the contracts for my country. Yeah, but Schweig's already given me several payments. Payments? <laughs> How do they compare with the money you now hold in your hand? Well, they don't compare, but I can't accept this money. I've already assured Schweig. Look, uh... Harry Lime, I know you. I know how your mind works. I have worked with men like you for years. Your loyalties belong to the highest bidder. In your hand, you hold the largest price yet offered for your services. When you present the contracts to the Alafin tomorrow, I am sure they will contain the name of the right country. A minute later, I was walking toward the bar of the hotel. I wasn't clutching the money the Baron had offered me in my tight little fist anymore. Uh-uh. No, I was making a comforting bulge in my wallet. The long mahogany gate to forgetfulness was deserted except for George Harris. George is a sort of glorified tourist guide who sometimes brought parties of American travelers to see the quaint charm of ancient decorata. Quaint yet. I'm not crowding, am I, Lime? <laughs> you were here first, so you couldn't be crowding me. All right, then you're crowding me, and it's a long bar. If there's anything silly looking, it's a long bar with one drinker at one end, one at the other. Come on, Harris, break down, have a drink with me. Lime, it may interest you to know that when I bring tourists here, I give them a little indoctrination lecture. Oh, that's very interesting. And part of it consists of a warning to keep away from a very unsavory American expatriate by the name of Harry Lime. Mm -hmm. You think I'm capable of contaminating you and your camera-toting babbits? I don't quite know what you're capable of, but the tourists who can afford to include a side trip to the Orient in their itinerary obviously have money. There's no sense in waving a branch of honeysuckle in front of a bee. Well, I guess that's my cue to buzz off, Mr. Harris. Don't worry about my trying to get even with you for all the nasty things you said. I'd much rather have my revenge when you're not prepared for it. I wasn't hungry, but I walked into the dining saloon. George Harris followed me, headed for a table festooned with his party of tourists. Usually his party consisted of bicarbonate of soda addicts, fugitives from board of directors meetings and generously proportioned dowagers, enjoying the money their late husbands had worked themselves to death, accumulating. But this time, there was a new note. A lovely, fresh-looking girl. She had the sort of innocence that only a Reynolds could have captured, or a Harry Lime. When she got up from the table, I followed her to the piazza. There wasn't a hovering mother, a chaperone, or a tourist guide in sight. Uh, I, I say, uh, you didn't drop your handkerchief. What? Uh, if you had, I could have picked it up and returned it to you. We could have started talking. Uh, I would have offered to show you the city. I oh. have a guide, thank you. Yes, I know, but I could show you places George Harris wouldn't dream of taking a 17-year-old girl to. I'm 19. Oh, oh, I've been wondering. Now, I've been wondering about a few other things, too, as a matter of fact. You must be the Harry Lyme Mr. Harris was telling us oh, about. Oh, surely I'm not the only man in Becorada capable of speculating a bit about a beautiful American girl. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Lyme, but the others will be coming out from lunch soon, and I mustn't be seen talking to you here in broad daylight. But it, it, it won't be broad daylight forever. Well, then, perhaps we'll meet this evening, Miss... Uh... Perhaps. <laughs> was a real looker, but with all the looks she was pushed to the back of my mind as I got to the summer palace of the Alephant later that afternoon. I rented Citroen and I was behaving nicely, and I guess I wasn't watching the road too carefully because suddenly the ordinarily deserted strip of pavement became crowded and I had to pull to a stop. Arabs riding burrows crowded about the car. There were some half casts on foot climbing on the running boards. In front of the car were three or four Bedouins, pretty fierce-looking customers with old-fashioned muskets slung over their shoulders. Hey, hey, what's all this about? I'm on my way to see your ruler. If I'm detained, you'll be very angry. I say, isn't there somebody here who speaks English? I speak English, Mr. Well, you, Lime. you're the chief teller from the Bank International. That's one of my occupations. Move over, Mr. Lyme. We have many things to talk about before you have your meeting with the Alafin. <laughs> Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man.
And now, Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with Love Affair. The beady-eyed, pockmarked Arab was sitting next to me in the front seat of my rented Citroen. The near equatorial afternoon was growing cold, the leather of the car's upholstery damp and clammy under my hand. But as the motley crew outside the car crowded close, I made an instinctive gesture toward the bulgy wallet that rested in my inside pocket. If you're thinking of reaching for a gun, Mr. Lyme, I might inform you that these few friends represent only a portion of Mr. Schweig's representatives in Bakurata. So you're Schweig's man in the bank. Precisely. Well, you can relax. I wasn't reaching for a gun. I have no need to relax, Mr. Lyme. But you appear a trifle nervous. Oh, no, not at all. But perhaps your gesture towards your pocket was only to assure yourself that your wallet was still safe. What are you getting at? I saw you get into Mordecai Vine's car outside the bank today. It would not be healthy to go against Mr. Schweig's wishes. No, I uh, (laughs) have no intention of doing that. I thought the idea might have occurred. Oh, no, not for a minute. If Monsieur Vine's offer was more interesting... Don't try it, Mr. Lyme. Keep your promise to Schweig. And then get out of town before Valley knows you've completed our arrangements with the Alafine. I'm not leaving town till I get the balance of the money Schweig owes me. He said he'd be waiting for me at the bank. And so it will be. And the bank will be closed by the time I leave the Alafine's palace. Well, you conclude the negotiations and then meet me at the bar of the hotel. Okay. I will have the money waiting for you there. All right, old man. It's a deal. And don't try any tricks. If you do, I will know about it before you have finished counting the money. My meeting with the high potentate of Becarata was an infuriating ordeal of delay. Somehow or other, the granting of oil rights seemed to be inexorably tied up with native dances and ceremonies and rituals, but the best I could manage was to leave the contracts with him and get in exchange a half-promise that he would sign them. I wondered if Schweig's fascinating messenger boy would be content with the arrangements. He was waiting for me there, all right. I came prepared, but I have been informed that the Alafin did not sign the contracts. Look, if you know they weren't signed, you also know I made them out the way you wanted them in favor of the power Schweig and you represent. My job here is finished. Even if I wanted to stick in Bicarada until the old Dota gets around to signing them, I couldn't. Not with Varen in town. I want the money. I've got it coming to me. Now, do you understand? Now. I'm not sure Schweig would approve. You've got the money in your side pocket. I can see the bulge. Now pull it out and start... Watch out. Lime. Varen. Varen knows. dead almost before I reached over and took the money from his side pocket. I could hear him topple from his chair as Baron and a handful of thugs burst into the room through the doorway, which one of them had shot him. They fired after me as I streaked out of the back door and I reached the rear of the hotel and jumped into the Citroen. Stepped on the start and as the motor caught, I clashed the gears the car leaped toward a narrow, torturous street. I wasn't sure where it led, but already I could hear other cars starting behind me. Natives and animals sprang out of my way as I careened down the winding street. The cars were further away now, but Ahead of me, I could see people milling about near a dimly lit cafe. There was a figure in white. Suddenly, I could see there was the girl, the American girl from the hotel. I don't know why, but something made me stop. Mr. Lyme, help me, help me. Oh, jump in. Get me away from here quickly. Hold on. Out of the way, watch out. What were you doing in the native quarter? I... George Harris wouldn't take me where I wanted to go, and I wanted to see the places, the places you spoke about this afternoon. So I slipped out of the hotel after dinner, and I I went to that native cafe back there. A horrible place. Two natives came up to my table, and I started to sneak out, and they followed me. Oh, I was never so happy to see anyone in my life. No, that's all right, honey. I'll take care of you. It'll be all right. But I can't call you 19 years old, uh, an American girl. <laughs> well... My name's Marion Lawrence. Hello, Marion. I'm an orphan, and a distant relative of mine died a few months ago and left me a little money. So I quit my job and decided to take a world cruise. Enter George Harris? No, I I didn't take one of those planned cruises. I 
just happened to join the conducted tour to Becerrado last weekend. And I wish I'd never come now. You better send a wire to Harris, though. He might notify your relatives or someone if you don't show up back at the hotel. Oh, there's no one to notify. I have no relatives or friends over here. Mm -hmm. Have your passport with you? No, I, I haven't. Well, I know someone near the border who's very talented as an engraver. However, we might obviate a lot of trouble by having him make out your passports with some new names. Say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Smith of <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio. That might do for both of us. How's that sound to you? It sounds real exciting. Like we were spies or espionage agents or something. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly. Marion was enthralled with the excitement and the romance of our adventure. It would take time for Vera and whoever else might be following me to pick up the trail. But by the time we crossed the border, all of that was changed. Marion and I were Mr. and Mrs. Joe Smith of Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Oh, yes, it was working perfectly because, as far as I could tell, Marion was the perfect bride, adoring, starry eyed, and really in love with me. Because she was in love with me, she asked no embarrassing questions. It was an added feature to it. It had become apparent that her little inheritance wasn't so little at all. Her purse contained a roll of large denomination bills big enough to choke a custom official. Did I embarrass you, dear, insisting on paying for my own clothes? Oh, no, you didn't embarrass me at all. But I'm constantly being surprised to find that you can buy Parisian models almost anywhere in the world if you have the money. Do you think it's safe traveling by car? Don't you think maybe we'd better leave it and take a train, Harry? I told you to get in the habit of calling me Joe. Well, I'm sorry. Why shouldn't I be safe? What are you hinting at? Oh, nothing. It's just that you told me the car was rented, and I thought... Well, stop thinking. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Marion, old girl. Nerves, I guess. The nerves lasted all that week as we crossed border after border. Becerrado was a long way back now, but I still kept imagining that I saw Varen and crowds as we went through custom offices. I thought I caught a glimpse of Schweig as we ate dinner in a funny little restaurant in Istanbul. Even though I'd seen him die, I could have sworn I saw the pockmarked face of the chief teller of the Bank International as we walked into a railroad office in Bucharest. By the time we'd reached Vienna, I think I'd almost begun to enjoy my role as the somewhat bucolic tourist. Are you happy, Joe? Dangerously. <laughs> the way I feel, I might never want to leave here. <laughs> I'd hate to think of what all this rich food would do to my figure if we stayed. I suppose neither of us have to order anything more to eat or drink. Well, it sounds as though there's plenty for all of us. Harris. George Harris. You don't mind if I join you? You talk like a cop, old I, man. I'm with the FBI of the United States. By the way, Harry Lyme, I think you might be interested in knowing that the elephant got a little tired of all your intrigue the day after you left. He awarded the oil leases to the U.S. So then Schweig's after me, too. What charges have you got against me? Charges? We have no charges against you. It still isn't against the law to be a skunk. Well, if there are no charges against me, I... I've uh... just been helping the Becurator authorities track down your sweet little bride. Why? Mary? I'm sorry, Harry. The night you picked her up in Becurator, she was fleeing from the hotel, where she just shot and killed her aging husband. You ready to leave, Marion? Uh, yes. Just a minute. Marion... I want to get this straight. It's no use talking, Harry. What he says is true. You mean, you mean that's why you came away with me? You mean I was the sucker you've been using no, me? Harry. Okay, I've been a lot of things in my life. I've even been married now. I've even been a sucker. But that's one that doesn't go in the book. But George, I don't see how you traced us. Through the big bills your wife spent on the trip. You see, her doting husband, uh, not you, the one she killed, cashed a large check at the Bank International a few hours before she did away with him. Luckily, the chief teller made a list of the serial numbers. Come on, Marion. Well, goodbye, Lime. By the way, where are you planning to be? We may need you for the trial. Well, you can always look for me, old man. There's no law against that. Tell you what, I'll give you a little hint. The elephant maybe hasn't signed that oil contract. He may need a little advice after all, so you'll probably find me in Becerrata for a while. There's a fortune teller I want to look up. I owe him some money. So long, Marion. Goodbye, old man. May your beard never grow white. May your shadow never grow less. <laughs> Lime returns in just a moment.
short marriage, but a very pleasant one. And if you should settle down somewhere and start enjoying easy living, rich food, and fine liquor, don't worry about what it'll do to your figure. Just about the fat it tends to develop between the ears. Mm-hmm. 